Ladies and gentlemen, seekers of truth and knowledge, welcome to a one-of-a-kind experience that will take you on a captivating journey beyond our world. Today, we have a special treat for you as we sit down with the renowned Andromedan contactee, Alex Collier. Prepare yourself for a rapid-fire question and answer session that delves into the depths of cosmic wisdom and unveils the mysteries of the universe. As always, please remember to like this video and share it with your friends and family. That way, it gets seen by more truth seekers. So, without further ado, here are today's rapid-fire questions and answers. Hi Alex, are we required to reincarnate or can we just alternatively go about our business in the universe without coming back physically? Um, it was my understanding in the early 2000s that reincarnation uh, was no longer mandatory. Uh, that souls were being given the freedom to leave but those souls who wanted to come back were also given the freedom to make that choice. So is it mandatory? No. My understanding is that, that it's not mandatory. You're not, you're not going to that place in lower fourth density realm and then being recycled and then sent back down here. No. My understanding is that's that's not what's happening now anymore at all. So, uh, because essentially that was a trap. They were just uh, they were just recycling souls, and as those souls kept coming into the physical, into specific bloodlines, they would trigger them for either emotional food, spiritual food, physical food. Uh, or fear and trauma. It, it all depends on what the objectives were. Uh, the agenda of those who have had control of the planet for the last 10,000 years, um, certainly the last 4,000, has been very, very dark. It's been very dark. And... Uh, there have been some lights in there, but overall, it's it's um, it's it's been very very tough sledding for humanity. Um, because they've done everything they could to truly hide most of our history. Um, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of something that you would think, why in the world would they not want to share that with us? Queen Elizabeth in 1577 sent the Pope in Rome asking for a papal bull allowing England to colonize the right to colonize and to basically ownership of the new world, what we now know as the United States. And in that original paperwork, uh, Queen Elizabeth's genealogists made reference to King Arthur and Prince Maroc. the colonies that they set up all along the northeast of the United States going all the way into the Ohio Valley. They actually make reference to that in the paperwork that they sent to the Pope in 1577. And I understand that the Pope had already made accommodations for Spain and Portugal. But why is that part of history never taught to us? that England petitioned the Pope using the fact that King Arthur and his brother were already here establishing colonies as early as 560 AD. 
why, why would they not want to share that part of history with us? I mean, that's just a little thing, but it's like a huge thing. And they just chose not to say anything. And the Smithsonian and, and other historical people, academia, they're absolutely complicit in all of this hiding of history. And how do I know about this? It's in the goddamn British Museum. <laughs> it's in the British Museum. <laughs> you know, I mean, just something like that we're not supposed to know about. You know, and for those of you who follow the show, The Curse of Oak Island, that, you know, knowing these little bits and pieces of history, it makes sense why the place is such an enigma. You know, the Templars, the, the Philistines, um, and so many other people who have been all up and down our coastline, you know, going back 2000 BC, they all knew it was here. You know, it's interesting. Why would they not want America to know? You know, why would they not want us to know? It's fascinating. It really is. So there's more we don't know than we do know. And we have to stay curious. You once talked about how the Andromedan ship was roughly 900 miles long. Can you go into a little more about what their ship culture is like? Examples would be if they have gravity enabling them to walk around. Do they have pets? What clothes do they wear? Food do they grow? If they I have, have marriage already, institutions. I have, I have talked about this ad nausea in the last 30 years, 29 years. Okay, ad nausea. And they're circular. They're circular. The circumference is 900 miles. But you need to understand something. And um, this is going to be a head thumper, head scratcher for a lot of you all. These ships are built in another dimension, in another frequency. When they come down through a dimension, say from five to four to three, they literally can choose the space that they take up inside their density. So the outside of that craft, I'm just gonna give you an example, is 900 miles in circumference, 900 miles. However, on the inside, it is three times as big, three times as large. Because when you get to the inside of the craft, you are, you are in fifth density. You are not in third density. The outside of the craft is, is creating the space in third density, which is 900 miles. Do you follow me? The outside is 900 miles. The inside is this, because it's fifth density. The 900 mile outside circumference is only holding the space in third density. All it's doing, it's holding the space in third density. When you enter that craft, you are now directly connected to fifth density. They pull it down with them, fifth density. They don't really leave it. They pull it down with them. You follow me? It's like a V. They pull fifth density down to third density. The outside of the craft is third density. The inside is still fifth density. This is why when we captured ships, or we went into wreckages, at least those that were intact, the insides were far bigger than the outside. And many of those that we got were fourth density. 
where it's more expansive and bigger than third density. It holds more bandwidth, more frequencies of light. It's amazing stuff. It's amazing stuff. Let's go to another question. Um, I have already talked about their culture ad nauseum so many times over the years. Um, I'm sure you can find it. What root race or group was Adam and Eve from? That's a great question. And you're not talking about a single individual, a single man or woman. You're not. What you're talking about are you a, a particular human form that was genetically created. in a laboratory on Mars, on Mars, and then brought here to see how it could adapt. Now the Edens were sanctuaries. They were domed sanctuaries, and what we mean by domed is not necessarily phys necessarily physical, but at atmospheric domes using technology, creating a, uh, a uh, an electromagnetic field, creating a dome, and then an atmosphere was created on the inside, an artificial atmosphere was created on the inside. And you know, Hoagland, to his credit, talked about this on on the moon. Some of these dome cities. Well, they were Edens. And some of those prototypes worked, and some of those prototypes didn't work. And the ones that didn't work were cast aside, thrown away, uh, or they died off. And those that did work um became part of humanity the interesting thing about that the real interesting thing about that is that the royal dna that was used in the final product contained enough material and frequency to attract soul. So when these, they were able to attract soul. In other words, spirit was able to attach to this physical form because of the DNA. Now, my understanding is about the royal DNA is that multiple races contributed to this. Um, but they used very specific bloodlines. And that was all passed down to humanity, all of it. But that's a very interesting conversation to have. And I just don't know at this moment how much to say or what not to say.
the uh, what matters is that is that we're all royalty here now every single one of us we literally if you take the model that we've always taught about bloodlines and blood we literally are all royalty on this planet and I'm not necessarily talking earth royalty okay there were some select families that were postulated and put above the others and uh, that was all done for political purposes or you know the winner gets to rewrite the rules and rewrite history <clears throat> but uh, those that call themselves royals today uh, they didn't really earn it it was handed to them to their forefathers and foremothers all they had to do was be absolutely ruthless to keep it so uh, but within those lineages and histories there were some very very good and benevolent monarchs really good monarchs uh, the line of of Arthur was the Merigruvian, Merigruvian, Merigruvian tribe, bloodline, which also shows up in France. Uh, and maybe that's why we don't hear about it, because that bloodline in France is directly linked to uh, uh, Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea. All kinds of history we don't know anything about. Someone obviously does, though. Um, and it's coming out in drips and drabs. It just it takes a lot of time to kind of piece it all together. So you see, there's there's a lot. There's an awful lot uh, that connects things. But your royalty, all of you are. All of you are. Dear Alex, with nine words, I don't understand how you can have all these experiences with Andromedans and not go absolutely bonkers being back in your normal normal life, normal life, Earth life. You seem like a level-headed person. So how have you handled the day-to-day -day all these years without going full-on tinfoil hat? Well, you see, when the screen goes off, uh, I put myself into a, into a padded cell and a straight jacket. <laughs> and the little tray slips underneath the front door with a straw, and that's how I eat. <laughs> oh. I try to be level headed. I try to stay grounded. And I am pretty grounded. I, I, I really am. And you know, the truth is that if I could have gone with them, I would have in a New York minute. I'm sorry, the beard is at one of those stages. Uh, in a New York minute, which is, I think, three seconds. <laughs> um, but that's just not in the cards. That isn't going to happen. So do I make myself absolutely miserable? Where do I have a life? And uh, why invest in being miserable when I can easily invest in being happy? And that's what I try to do. I try to invest in being happy. I mean, you know, I, I complain <laughs> to my closest friends about needing a vacation from Earth. You know, but the truth is, I have some really good days on Earth. Um, you know, if the intelligence agencies and the dark ones would fuck with me 
it would have been a really great life. I probably could have had a really great life. Um, but, you know, I knew, I knew what I was getting into. You know, which is why I had long conversations with my dad before he passed away about doing this kind of work. You know, because, you know, I, I knew I was going to catch, I was going to catch shit. And, you know, it comes with the territory. You know, when you, when you get the clippers out and you cut the fence and you allow the herd to roam outside the fence, you're going to catch some shit. And uh, those of us who have done this kind of work, um, not necessarily just contactees, but researchers, scholars, uh, archaeologists, historians who have chosen to tell a different narrative than the allowed or agreed to narrative, you know, we all catch shit. You know, but I'm here. I can't leave, at least not the way I want. So why not be happy? Why not make the best of it? And that's all anyone can do is, is to make the best out of your life every single day. And uh, And by example, show others that no matter how bad it is, it can always get better. It can always get better. But you first got to believe it. You got to believe it's going to get better in, in order for that frequency to be attracted to you, for you to pull down that, that possibility. Because it all starts right here. It do. It do. So, that's a short answer. <laughs> Have the Andromedans given some specific directives that we humans can do daily to assist in our individual ascension. I like the quote from Ram Dass, I can do nothing but for you, but work on myself. I can't say specifically anything that would specifically help with the one's ascension. I will share with you what they have said to me about what I need to do um, for myself. That would benefit me the most. Uh, because I, I've needed some. I've needed some coaching. Uh, you know, there have been times where I wanted to leave, and, and, and one specific time I was ready to do it myself. I just didn't care, and it all really had to do with with grounding myself. And then there's the angel event, which I've already shared. Um, the A's have always said be out in nature to be quiet to listen to nature to calm yourself down to get to a place where you could hear your own frequency and whenever I would do that when I could get to a place where it's, it's, it's just outdoors I'm in the sun I'm listening to the birds the wind the trees and I, and I get to a place where I can just Feel my own frequency. I am a very different person. Because there's no chatter. There's 
no people tugging on me to rescue them and save them when, you know, I'm, I'm trying to save myself. There was a time, February 2003, where uh, I was done. I was done. Hell would have been an acceptable alternative. <laughs> and uh, I was pulled out of my body. And I was held above the ceiling looking down at myself. And the being that was holding me, which was feminine, asked me to describe what I was looking at. And I told her. And then she asked me, how do you feel? And I didn't feel any of those things that I described what I saw. And that was such an aha moment for me. Because at that moment, I realized I was looking at my body and what my ego was doing to it. Here I was detached from the body, and I'm the soul. And I realized that wasn't me. That truly wasn't how I felt. I had allowed a portion of myself to literally take over and drive me to a place where I wanted to leave. And none of the belief systems that I was holding on to, cherishing, were real. Uh, my life changed a lot after that. It didn't mean I didn't have challenges, because because I did. I had huge challenges with homelessness, uh, cancer. But I'm here today. And uh, I have a completely different perspective about those growth opportunities. And I realize that, to make a long story short, my journey my journey is one that I have literally cut out of the wilderness myself. And exactly where it's going, I'm not quite sure exactly but i'm not afraid of it i'm tired I'm tired but i'm not afraid of it i don't i don't uh, i don't i never wake up in fear anymore because i get it i get it life's the journey and uh you know, the A's pointed out to me that I've been here for 62,000 years as a soul. So I'm looking forward to the next 62,000. I, I, I would like a vacation from Earth, though. I'll tell you that straight away. You know, I've been, I've been thinking about opening up a Starbucks in Antares or someplace like that. <laughs> you know, with, with that spaceport for, for drive through I think that'd be fun. <laughs> or just hang out on the beach, you know, read some good books, listen to great music. Do you know what the first root race was on our planet? The very first root race. Uh, my understanding is that they came from Cirrus, the dog star. That was the first. And they were visiting 
and they ended up setting up the very first colonies. And uh, they were red-skinned. It wasn't the reptilians. They were not the first. But it was the dog star, Cirrus A, to be exact. And then shortly after that, B. Excuse me, they were the first. I think the Dogons of uh, the Congo actually actually talk about that. I think uh, there's even a book written about it. Uh, I don't, for the life of me, I can't remember the name of the book, but uh, but it was Cirrus. They were the first to visit Earth and to explore it, to map it, and then they set up a very small colony. So technically, they were the first. They planted their flag first. There you have it, fellow truth seekers. An enlightening and exhilarating rapid fire question and answer session with the remarkable Alex Collier, sharing his profound encounters with the benevolent Andromedan extraterrestrial beings. As we continue on our cosmic journey, let us embrace the wisdom of the Andromedans and carry their message of love, unity, and compassion with us. Together, we can create a world where humanity stands united, ready to embrace the wonders that await us in the vast expanse of the universe. If you found this rapid fire question and answer session fascinating, don't forget to hit that like button and share this video with your friends and family. Subscribe to our channel and ring the notification bell so you never miss out on more captivating content like this. Thank you for joining us on this incredible adventure. Until next time, May the stars guide you on your path of enlightenment and exploration, and remember to always seek knowledge and stay curious. If you would like to see Andromeda and contact the Alex Collier live via video stream, we host an online seminar three times a month on a Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. For more information and dates of upcoming online seminars, please visit alexcollier.org. Please click on one of the above videos to seek more of Alex Collier's knowledge.